of what Yahweh inspired uh, his prophet to write in the 17th chapter of the book of Yashaya. It means salvation is from Yah. It's been corrupted to Isaiah. We had reached the sixth statement of the 17th chapter at the conclusion of our program yesterday. Reprising that, it reads, So in him, speaking of Jacob, and thus of Israelites, individuals who engage and endure with God, and the children of, co of the covenant, there will be those who leave, that means leave the earth, on the precipice of war, based upon the choices they have made. Gleanings, a smaller secondary harvest, is going, uh, is going to happen in the manner of encompassing, of shaking them off as a means of, ha of harvesting an olive tree. Two or three ripe olives in the top uppermost branch. That would be speaking of Israelites. And four or five on her fruitful branches that have been separated. Those would be Goyim children who are adopted into the covenant. Prophetically declares Yahweh, the mighty one of Yisrael, of individuals who engage and endure with God. Olives, uh, as I shared yesterday, produced uh, oil that was burned in lanterns. They pierced the darkness. They illuminated homes. They were the flesh of the olive was used to nourish. The ointment of the olive was used to heal. The light enabled uh, parents to read and recite Yahweh's Torah to their children. There's most important responsibility. And as I shared yesterday, olives as a tree are firmly rooted in the land and they are among the world's largest, longest living trees. Now on this occasion, the covenant's children are being removed from the tribulation, from a vexing time of grief at what appears to be the last possible moment before the tribulation turns ruthlessly violent. Yahweh is allowing his witnesses to remain and share his message with the world right up to the point that prolonging his children's stay would put his family in harm's way. So while he's only able to harvest 7,000 souls, he loves every one of them. The future for the vast preponderance of those who remain is to be left behind, and they will die estranged for God, at least estranged from God in the sense that as we approach the midpoint of the tribulation, there will no longer be the choice to simply die and remain that way. Everyone is going to live on, either eternally separated from God or live eternally in his presence in heaven. Speaking of those who have chosen the better option, he says on that specific day, this man who is a descendant of Adam will genuinely regard and always accept the Almighty, his Maker, and his eyes will actually and continuously look upon that God, the set-apart one of Israel. So then he shall never regard, accept, or consider, nor look at, nor look upon the religious altars, these works which fingers have made. They will not focus upon either the Asherah, the religious myths representing Babylon and the Lord Baal, or worship sun god images and resulting religious monuments. It's interesting, of course, that God chose the word Adam for man because it directs us right back to the Garden of Eden. You know, if you look at the conditions that existed in the Garden of Eden, there was... Uh, no mention of a religious building. There was no mention of a religious ritual. There was no mention of religious teachers. There was no mention of any human institution. There was no government. There was no politics. There was no religion. There was no faith. There was no military. There was no economic scheme being perpetrated. These are the things of man. God created the conditions in the Garden of Eden. They were not there. And what God is telling us is that when Adam, mankind, re-enters his idea of a joyful enclosure, heaven, they will see it just as we witness Eden. Perfect because it is devoid of religion and politics and militarism. Human corruption and lies. 
These are very, very important concepts. If you want to go to heaven, walk away from religion. And do so now. Yahweh reminds those left behind who have been called home that they will find heaven devoid of religion. Good riddance. He has told us that there will be this huge contrast. We are going to see the worst of religion being perpetrated on earth. The worst of militarism, the worst of politics and governance, the worst of human institutions being perpetrated on the earth. And those who have been harvested will see none of these things. God goes on to say in the ninth statement, in that specific day it will come to be that the cities of his, now he's still dealing with Jacob's and thus Yisrael's refuge, and his defensive fortifications shall be abandoned like an occult presence in the thicket, as if drugged with mind-altering incantations, even biological agents. And then the uppermost branch of the olive, therefore, will be completely deserted for a time because of the presence of the children of Israel, and so appalling desolation and stupefying ruin, a stunning deforestation, horrible devastation, leaving these places uninhabitable and deserted, and that's going to exist for a time, as a result of the choices that have been made. Once God's children are gone, then Israel is going to be inundated with Islamic terrorists. Islam is more adroitly satanic than any other mainstream religion ever conceived. It will be like an occult presence. Islam is especially effective at intoxicating its victims as they will act as if they're drugged. I mean, you have to be out of your mind. You have to be poisoned to believe that God wants you to kill so that you can inherit a paradise filled with multiple virgins that you can abuse with constant conquests. To be a Muslim and choose to spend time with a God who is depicted in the Quran spending all of his time in hell means that you're not in your right mind. When the Quran claims to confirm the Torah, when in fact it contradicts everything that is stated in the Torah, including God's name, and you believe the Quran over the Torah, then you are as if out of your mind with drugs. The religious are almost always drugged. It is a poison, but no more so than Muslims mind-altering incantations, rendering the mind wholly ineffective, a poison for the brain. And God's saying this when this occurs. Fortunately, the ripe olives, they will be gone. Those that could be harvested have been harvested. And appalling desolation, stupefying ruin, stunning deforestation, horrible devastation is going to occur. In Israel. But not to his children, but yet to his chosen people. All because of the choices they have made. With the restraining influence of Yahweh's set apart troubadours now gone, all hell will break loose. And since the defensive fortifications surrounding the cities will be abandoned as a result of religious incantations and chemical agents, that we are now going to see horror manifest. And God depicts the number of Muslims that flood into Israel as being unstoppable. There won't be enough bullets to stop them. And unfortunately, Israel, like the most of the world, was unwilling to wield words wisely to thwart their advances at a time that that was possible, where the truth would have prevailed. Israel's defenses will immediately fail, and many cities, towns, and settlements will be overrun. Much of the land will be abandoned as it is deforested and poisoned. That said, there is a possibility that his could be addressing Adam, and if so, it's mankind's population centers and military prowess which will become desolate and impotent, suggesting that this carnage could be global. 
The argument against a more pervasive option that his rep represents mankind's as opposed to his representing Yaakov and this Israel is that Ha Adam, the man, being described is now in heaven, having been rescued by the sacrificial lamb. So what follows speaks of having forgotten your Savior, uh, and Yahweh has introduced himself to the Israelites in his Torah, and has saved them from slavery in Egypt, the crucible of religious oppression. But Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and secular humanists have never known Yahweh, and thus could not have forgotten him. That's profound. They, God's going to say that the choice that you made was to forget the rock of your salvation. You have forgotten who God is. Well, the truth is, the Jews have. They were told. Christians haven't. They've never known God. Nor have Muslims, Hindus, or socialist, secular humanists. So this is devastation inside of Israel. God has just said that Yaakov will become vulnerable as a result of being thinned. And now he is about to describe an Islamic invasion of Israel. As a result, we'd be wise to see Israel's defenses and Israel's cities faltering and succumbing at this juncture. But that does not mean that these options are exclusive with one precluding the other. When more than one possibility exists, more times than not, God wants us to consider each of them in this vein. The specific things excluded from heaven may be germane to Christianity, not Islam, and thus to the U.S. and to the E.U., not Israel. Further, God has delineated two groups of individuals who will be gleaned, most of whom are Goyim, not Yehudim. So from this perspective, the warning directed against America in the opening line of the next chapter could simultaneously reflect parallel and sequential events. After all, the United States has been complicit up to this point, having caused the Syrian war, having armed the Muslim combatants, and having led to the, the parade to then the promised land, giving the West Bank to the Islamic terrorists. This being the case, life will become unbearable for humankind, and especially for the nation that earns Yahweh's ire the United States of America will return to this prophecy when shattering this continues after the break. If you'll note, this prediction was once again prefaced with the line in that specific day. So all of this is taking place in quick succession. From the time that the Syrian government falls and Damascus is a heap of ruins to the time that, that terrorists are on display um, slashing uh, their religion, religious ideals at humanity, to the time that Israel is thinned at the, the waist and becomes indefensible. To the time that Yahweh conducts the Teruah harvest of saved souls, removing 7,000 of his covenant children from this planet. To the time that Israel, much of it, becomes a wasteland of devastation as a result of the torrent of Muslims flooding in. It is all a matter of very quick succession. It's all presented in that specific day. The most overtly occult of popular religions will pour into the promised land like a plague of death. The resulting devastation and desolation will be stupefying, leaving much of Israel deserted and uninhabitable. These terms were chosen with precision. We need to recognize that we as humans get caught up in normality. We think that because Yesterday and the day before and the day before and most likely tomorrow are reasonably good. That um, there is no world war, that there is no economic collapse, that there is no riot or anarchy, that tomorrow will bring the same. But it's not going to. We are within uh, a matter of 
12 years of complete collapse, of devastating world war. That's not to say that the world won't erupt in war. If Obama gets his way, it will, between now and then. But this particular war is 12 years away. This devastation is 12 years away. This economic collapse is 12 years away. And it's, people are going to get comfortable. They're going to say, ah, you know, I just can't imagine that all of this horrible stuff is going to transpire because we, we get caught in a rut where our minds are just incapable of processing something as radically different as what this is foretelling. But my friends, the individual who inspired Yashia to commit these words to paper 2,700 years ago he has a track record on his predictions. They have all happened exactly as he has foretold. Thousands of predictions never got one wrong. This won't be the first he gets wrong. This is all going to occur. Yahweh reveals that this will be endured because most Israelites have forgotten what he has done for them. They remain ignorant, in part because they favor rabbinic Talmud arguments over Yahweh's Torah teaching. And as a result of having rejected the covenant's terms, they are estranged and therefore unprotected and vulnerable. It's not that God is going to bring this Islamic on onslaught. He's not. He's just not initially going to defend his rebellious people from them because they've chosen not to rely on him. Had they chosen to rely on him, it never would have happened. But they will depend on their weapons and their training rather than their God and Savior. And as a result, they're going to experience the worst that Islam can deliver. God says on the 11th statement of the 17th chapter, Indeed, because rather branded by another, you have completely ignored and have actually forgotten, becoming totally ignorant of the God of your salvation and deliverance, your Savior, and the rock of your protection and refuge. You did not mention or remember the Most High. Therefore, you plant the Lord's vines. You continually sow an illegitimate, unauthorized, and loathsome means to estrangement by way of a vine branch that needs to be pruned. In that day, you raise your garden. And in the early part of the day, your seed, it will bud and sprout, reaping a shaken and corrupt heap, which will later be piled up and thrust aside. In the daytime, there will be nothing but weakness, affliction, and tribulation including the influence of incurable and incapacitating physical pain and mental anguish. There is a myth, one actively promoted by hundreds of thousands of ortho, ultra-Orthodox Jews today, especially in Israel, that religious Jews are Torah observant. But according to the evidence, according to reason, and according to Yahweh, this isn't accurate. Orthodox Jews have made religion their profession. Spending every waking hour obeying the laws rabbis have imposed on them. Their scriptures found in the oral law, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah. Not in the Torah. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Orthodox Jews thoughtlessly bob their heads while reciting rabbinical prayers from rote. There isn't one, not amongst the millions of them, that knows Yahweh or follows his guidance. God is creeped out by them. You just look at pictures of them as they gather around the western wall with their little curly cues and their, their uh, wrinkled black suits and their black hats. Yeah. I mean, I'm repulsed, and I, I am repulsed generally by religious garb. I don't care if it's a Muslim dressed in a tent, a hajib, or if it's a, uh, a Amish woman that uh, has got her little uh, get-up-and-go on with the, the long dress and the little white beanie on, the, uh, on her head. 
I just think religious garments show a complete and utter lack of thinking. And so I'm not uh, the least bit impressed with the uh, the black hats and the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. I think they are disgusting. But I will tell you that my animosity, my frustration, my disdain, my disgust at them is a fraction as great as is God's. Thinking themselves to be godly, they are the antithesis of that. Now, sadly, what God has described here is only the beginning of the bloodbath that Israelis are going to endure. And as a direct result of their religion, of Judaism, the birth pangs are now over, and this is now the onset of the Great Tribulation, the time of Yaakov's troubles. But none of this should be seen as God judging the world. Based upon his own testimony, he is currently celebrating this time with his family in heaven. God's focus is elsewhere. Yahweh isn't orchestrating this affair, nor micromanaging these events. He is simply allowing us to witness what is going to occur. In fact, it is the remaining Israelites' interest to have these appalling events progress to the point that they can finally realize that they're incapable of stopping the horror they're experiencing. And to a great degree, that they, the horror they have brought upon themselves. It's only then that a remnant will come to their senses and will acknowledge that neither their nation, neither their religion, neither their intellect, neither their ingenuity, nor wealth, nor their military can save them. And that's what really everyone in the world needs to recognize. That your intellect can't save you, your religion can't save you, your nation can't save you, your ingenuity can't save you, your wealth won't save you, your military most certainly won't save you. And you come to realize there's only one individual who can save you. And his plan of salvation is articulated in the Torah, which is where you need to turn if you want to get to know him and understand what he's offering and appreciate how you can avail yourself of his generous offer. Well, coming to recognize that there is no human institution that can save humankind and that, in fact, these human institutions are counterproductive. Those who recognize this and no longer rely on man's institutions will have taken the first step towards God. They will have accepted the first codicil of the covenant, which is to walk away from their country. Speaking of Israel's assailants, very few know, but it is nonetheless true, that if there were not for rabbis, Islam would not exist. According to the Hadith, and confirmed in the Quran, rabbis in Yathrib, today's Medina, sold Talmud citations to Muhammad, which he then incorporated into his Quran. Without these stories, the resulting book would have been too dark and depraved to fool anyone. It's an important realization at this time. Also telling, while many hundreds of thousands of ultra, ultra-Orthodox ultra Israelis are opposed to their nation's military and have fought politically to keep from having to serve in it, others will perceive that the Israeli defense forces and the Israeli economic ingenuity are prevailing. They're going to think, aren't we doing a marvelous job? Well, at least up to this point in time. Initially, the desert has and will continue to bloom. And initially, up to this point, the enemy, Islam, has been kept at bay. But those blossoms of hope are going to wither and they're going to fade away. Yahweh has affirmed that Israelites have been doing the work of the Lord, also known as Satan, the adversary. And so they're going to be pruned to save the rest of the vine. These discarded, short-lived twigs will be tossed aside because the disease infecting them is, disease, is deemed infectious and incurable. So this day will usher in the tribulation, a time of great affliction. Seven young, long years of incapacitating physical pain and mental anguish. 
when we consider these statements as part of the whole fabric of Yahweh's prophetic testimony, it would be reasonable to conclude that this dismissal of the Israeli industry and uh, their allegiance brings us to the spring of 2027. This is four to six months after the affirmation of the peace treaty, finalizing the emasculation of the promised land. So you see, the harvest that is commiserate with that treaty is going to place, take place on the seventh, first day of the seventh month of the year on Teruah, usually in um, early October, sometimes in very late September. And uh, the outbreak of war after that peace treaty, after Yahweh's children have been taken home, is going to be within months of that time. I would assume three, four, five months. That's about the extent of the time <laughs> that is going to transpire. And so when it occurs, and now as I say, we're in the early spring of 2027, Muslims by the millions from nations the world over. Sensing the enemy of Allah's uh, vulnerability, they're going to arrive. They're going to be roaring Allahu Akbar, it's trying to suggest that Allah is greater than the God of the Jews, Yahweh. It's going to be a tidal wave of terrors. During what is most assuredly the onslaught of the Magog War, this war that unifies Islam against Israel, Mujahideen will flood into the land from all directions, but this time the Israeli defense forces will be unable to stop them. Agitated and anguished screams will lead to societal chaos, as the promised land is inundated with those who seek to destroy it on behalf of their demonic deity. 17.12 reads, So woe, be wary of a great many nations. Roaring like hordes of agitated terrorists, these multitudes of confused and loudmouthed militants, flaunting what they possess, similar to the chaotic uproar of loudly snarling and growling seas, they will wail in agitated and anguished screams, and the roar of societal chaos of the people of these nations will be like the horrible uproar of floodwaters intensely and in great number, with grating passion. They will continue to strive, they will continually strive, to desolate and lay waste. At this point, confronted with the first of the two woe warnings that Yahweh has integrated into this dire prophecy, we know that many nations will dispatch a veritable sea of Islamic jihadists. Over one million Mujahideen will emerge from the 50 Islamic fiefdoms. With a, at least there's 50 with a majority Muslim population, and just from these alone, we're going to see over 100 million Mujahideen. The horrible places that have a majority Islamic populations that are the breeding grounds for death and destruction. They include, and let me give them to you in alphabetical order, Afghanistan, which is 99.8% Muslim. There are 29 million uh, Muslims in, uh, in Afghanistan. Albania is 82% Islamic 2.6 million Muslims. Algeria, 98% Islamic, 35 million Muslims. Abergeyan, I should say, 98% Muslim. There are 8.795 million Muslims there. Bahrain, 81% Islamic, 655,000 Muslims. Bangladesh, 90% Islamic, with 148.6 million Muslims, with nothing to live for and everything to die for. In Brunei, 52% Islamic, 
211,000 Muslims. Burkina Faso, 59% Islamic. 9,600 Muslims. Chad, 56% Islamic. 6 million, I should say, in Bruno Faso is 9,600,000 Muslims. In Chad, 50% Islamic, 6,400,000 Muslims. Comoros, 98% Islamic, 679,000 Muslims. Djibouti, 97% Islamic, 853,000 Muslims. Egypt, is 95% Islamic. Now, there are a lot of folks that say that Egypt is 90% Islamic. That Christian population is dwindling rapidly, and the Muslim population is increasing rapidly. 80 million Muslims. Gambia, 95% Islamic. 1.7 million Muslims. Guinea, 84% Islamic. 8.7 million Muslims. Indonesia, 88% Islamic, 205 million Muslims. Iran, 99.7% Islamic, 75 million Muslims. Iraq, 98.9% .9 Islamic, with 31 million Muslims. Jordan, 98.8% Islamic, 6 million Muslims. Karakistan, 50% Islamic. 9 million Muslims. Kosovo, 92% Islamic. 2 million Muslims. We'll continue this list so that you know where the belligerents will come from. I'd like to complete the list of uh, majority Islamic countries so that we know the hell holes from which over 100 million Islamic Mujahideen will flood out of as they seek to destroy Israel. Um, and then in the not too distant future, this is going to occur um, 13 years from now. Kuwait is 86% Islamic with 2.6 million Muslim. Kyrgyzstan, 89% Islamic, 4.9 million Muslims. Lebanon, 60% Islamic, 2.5 million Muslims. Libya, 97% Islamic, 6.3 million Muslims. Malaysia, 61% Islamic, 17 million Muslims. The Maldives, 98% Muslims, 309,000 of them. Mali, 92% Islamic, 12 million Muslims. Mauritania, 99.2% Islamic, 3.3 .3 million Muslims. Morocco, 99.9% .9 Islamic, 32 million Muslims. Niger, 98% Islamic, 15.6 million Muslims. Nigeria, 50% Islamic, 75 million population there. Oman, 88% Islamic, 2.5 million. Pakistan, 96% Muslim, 178 million of them. The so-called Palestinian Authority, 98% Islamic. So much for diversity. 4.3 million Muslims. Qatar, 78% Islamic, 1.1 million. Saudi Arabia, 97% Islamic, and it's only 97% is 100% because of uh, hired workers. 25.4 million Muslims. Senegal, 96% Islamic, 12.3 million. Sierra Leone. Leon, another hellhole, 72% Islamic, 4.1 million people. Somalia, 98.6% Islamic. No wonder the country is such a hellhole. 9.2 million Muslims with nothing to live for. The Sudan is 71% Islamic. No wonder it is the source of the world's worst genocide in recent memory. 31 million Muslims. Syria, 93% Islamic. 20.8 million Muslims. Tajikistan, 99% Islamic, 7 million Muslims. Tunisia, 99.8% Islamic, 10 million Muslims. Turkey, oh, that garden spot of, uh, of, of religious intolerance that uh, perpetrated the second worst Holocaust and genocide uh, apart from World War II. That one in World War I, 98.6% Islamic, 75 million Muslims. 
Turkmenistan, 93% Islamic, 4.8 million. United Arab Emirates, 76%, 3.5 million. Uzbekistan, 97% Islamic, 27 million Muslims. Western Sierra, 99.6% Islamic, 528,000. And Yemen, where the uh, United States now is waging war, 99% Islamic, 24 million people. The average age of the rising Islamic population of 1.275 billion in these 50 countries is 22, with more than two-thirds of fighting age, which will be between 15 and 50. Since 90% of jihadists are male, and uh, since 70 to 80 percent of Muslims are fundamentalists in places like this, and thus predisposed religiously to be mujahideen, if only one in three of those who are eligible to fight are motivated by their clerics, political potentates, the media, and peers to do so, these nations alone will dispatch an estimated 130 million fighters in all this cause. And since those who might otherwise defer would be defined as hypocrites by the Quran's ninth surah, and would be killed by fellow Muslims as apostates. As many as half of the fundamentalist Muslim men of appropriate age may seek to earn paradise points with their God. Moreover, life isn't worth living in most of these places. There is little or no hope for a better tomorrow. Lies prevail and truth is a casualty. As a result, the number of enraged religious fanatics could reach 200 million individuals. There simply wouldn't be enough bullets or bombs to stop them. But that would not be the end of the militants. The 30 nations where collectively another 285 million Muslims reside, which boast a significant percentage of Allah devotees, will also send millions of Mujahideen. All of these countries are provide a long list, including Russia, with 16 million Muslims. There are countries like Ethiopia, with 28 million Muslims. Even China has an enormous amount of Muslims. We'll return to this topic on our show tomorrow. May God bless.